Não, esse é o filtro. Pronto, está um filtro. Não, para que ele está, isso aqui. Tá bom, assim? Ok, Mia, good to see you. Good to see you too. How are you doing? Recovering well? I'm, I'm good, thank you. Okay. Doing well, a bit of uh, teaching here and there and doing research, so everything okay. Okay, very good. I apologize to our audience for the delay in our uh, beginning. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Miranda Moyer from Shell, uh, probably she, she had some problem. We couldn't contact her, although she uh, confirmed her presentation. So we are starting now the, the uh, second seminar week of the Enhanced Recovery Laboratory. And I would like to thank uh, Professor uh, Amihaou from uh, Utrecht University for the opening of the, the second seminar week. So we are here at uh, Fuldão uh, uh, with several research researchers from, from the laboratory, but we have several other people online following your presentation, Amir. Thank uh, you. Thank you so much again. And uh, you may share your screen and the uh, uh, floor is all yours. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm now looking to how to share the screen here. I have something called present. Yeah, that's it. And, and I should go on this, yeah, share screen. You can share a slide. Share a slide. Ah, share a slide. Yes. So, a slide, and, and I don't see, like I should say, from your computer. Okay. Upload file. Uh, interesting uh, way. Open. Oh, please choose a smaller file. The size limit is 50 MB, it says. Uh, then, okay, give me a chance to see how can I share this because I have the presentation here because I have a PowerPoint open now in the screen and I say present slides, but doesn't show any. Uh, I, uh, let, let me see if I can share my screen. Share screen. Oh, window. Here we go. And I've see, do you see my screen? Are you seeing my screen? Uh, are you seeing my screen? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Okay. And now you see my presentation, right? Yes, yes, yes. Perfect. Okay, let's start then. So, uh, so okay, I'll, I'm gonna give a presentation about uh, port network modeling for subsurface applications and the opportunities and challenges involved there. Uh, well, as Paula Koto mentioned, my name is Amir Raouf. I'm in hydrogeology uh, group in Utrecht University, and I'm director of multi-scale porous media lab that we perform um, integrated numerical and experimental work on porous materials. Before I start with pore network modeling, I will just tell you how does it sit in our uh, team and 
how we perform research in the, our integrated lab uh, altogether. And we look at different scales, as you can see uh, here, I'm gonna try to make it in a laser pointer. So probably you see my laser pointer now. Uh, um, my research goes across different columns that I show in this um, slide. Uh, what for upscaling that we want to do, upscaling of flow and transport, we start to zoom in into the individual pores of porous materials, and then we zoom out to this more sample scale. Uh, and by doing this, which is called upscaling, we, we try to just find out what are the transport uh, and flow mechanisms that are taking place and should be considered in the field scale models. So an example of it is like when you zoom in inside a porous material, you see single pores. And there, for example, we use lattice Boltzmann modelings to look at, for example, how fines and particles like clays move in, this, in the single pores and how do they, for example, start to clog and lower the permeability of the rocks. So this is the first scale, which is uh, tens of nanometers to, few, uh, to, to some micrometers. And for experimental observation of it, we use confocal microscope. And then the, the next um, scale is when you zoom out, you see the sample together here, like a thin section uh, scale, let's say. There we, we see individual pores, but we we'll also see how pores are connected together. And then if you go one scale larger, you can see three-dimensional sample, which is pore network modeling that I will explain today. So in this scale, that you can see, we can simulate a pores of a small piece of rock and individually and see what's going um, and on within individual pores of the rock. And from this line to the right, then we enter to the realm of continuum scale modeling, like Darcy scale modeling is also called. So we do columnar scale or we perform field scale. So I would try to focus on this, but uh, uh, this pore network modeling today, uh, but another thing is that uh, we perform uh, using the images, extra images that we do a lot in, in my group, we perform microfluidic studies. It means like if you have a rock or soil, you image it, you make a 3D image of it, then you choose uh, one of the images like here. And from that, we make microfluidics that you can see here. And then we perform various experiments on these microfluidics. Basically using this, we make mimics of the rocks, mimics of the pore structures that we can see through our rocks. And what we see in, inside this experiment is that we can see how solutes and chemicals transport within porous materials, how particles can transform make clogging, and we can even uh, grow bacteria because you know in the subsurface, there is lots of bacteria and biofilm growth around the sand grains or rock grains and vetability effects. But you know that uh, in also petroleum engineering, that vetability of the rocks is a major parameter to determine how flow happens between the rock and the storage problems. So one example of it, you can see it here. For example, this is a, a, a sand uh, stone mic microfluidic. And then when we, uh, uh, under microscope, we can see, for example, as you see it here, how individual particles are being transported between the grains and whether they uh, like here, they attach or they move along the sample. So with this, the next scale that I have shown to you was poor network model scale, which means a three-dimensional domain of a small sample. I will go through uh, various processes and I have sorted them according to complexity of the media. So when we talk about poor scale, the first uh, thing that comes to your mind is that the, well, you should provide the space of the pore space of the rock. Basically, the first input is pore space representation. You should have a information of pore, pore spaces to be able to do pore scale modeling. And then imagine if you have a sample uh, geometry, the first thing that you can do is basically transport of single phases. Like when it's all the pores are occupied by one single fluid or a salt tracer is transporting through the rock. If you make it one step more complex, you can have two phases flowing through the media. So for example, you can have oil and gas or water and air, and now you have another uh, porous media. If you make it even more uh, uh, complex, you can have a multi-scale multi, multi -scale porous media. It means, for example, dual porosity porous media. Those who work in a, in a uh, professor Paul Cotto's group, do you know you have these carbonates, coquinas that are multi-scale actually. 
So you have a small pores and much larger pores. And next step is that when the fluid that passes through rock is also adsorptive or reactive and it changes the pore spaces, it dissolves the rock. So you can see, you can look at the a pore network modeling through complexity of the, the process. I will start, I will go one by one of these to show you the applications. So the first one was pore space representation. One uh, way of pore space representation, uh, which is uh, actually for our collaboration with uh, Paulo Cotes group, is um, uh, I put it here. It's uh, uh, you have rock samples, you perform 3D imaging, for example, you X-ray tomography, and you get pore space of this rock. And when you have the pore space of this rock, you provide it as an input to uh, pore scale models. One, uh, the, the model that we very often use is Pore Studio, which is actually a, a model developed by uh, software developed by uh, myself last year that performs uh, various um, processes, a multi uh, physics in, in a pore networks. So, for example, you provide the pore spaces and you obtain the, uh, the pressure distribution or flow distribution or multi phase flow reactive transport between the samples. So, this is one way of providing the input. You take a sample, you image it. But another one will be just to you make the these pores of the sample yourself using the information that you have. And why do you want that? Because not always you have X-ray tomography of your sample. And furthermore, if you make, for example, this sample, if you make X-ray of it at this location and next at this location here, this location, they are different. They're slightly different. That's why I have developed a method which is called the multi-scale. Uh, multi-directional pore network modeling or random based network. Using this network, what you do, you create sample of the pore spaces using the knowledge of the average pore sizes and average connection between the pores of the rock. For example, you can, from this analysis, you know the coordination number, which is called the connection between the pores. You know how many pores are connected together um, and what is the frequency of it and you know the uh, size of the pores and using that you can simply provide uh, uh, to this model that would generate for you an, uh, a sample so this sample is not exactly the rock sample however it is uh, equivalent to that in a sense that the pores are connected in a similar manner and the permeability and porosity of it are similar to a sample therefore uh, the whole strategy is summarized here as that you have a sample you can image it you can perform poor network modeling on the image of this. And I call it uh, direct mapping. So you have an image of rock and you simulate based on that. Another step is that you can go further and make many equivalent of that sample and also simulate using them. And as I mentioned to you, there are two reasons for me to use this. One is that you don't always have extra tomography. And the other reason is that you have variability in your sample. And using this, you can make uh, hundreds and thousands of twins of this sample and see how to do the, the twins uh, that are uh, statistically equivalent but not completely map of this sample, how do they behave? And using that, you know the variation of, for example, porosity and permeability of the rock that you can expect. So when you have these networks, when you provide poor network modeling, you can simulate a wide variety of the uh, process using poor network modeling. As I've shown here, you can look at the transport of solutes and chemicals. You can look at the capillarity, two-phase flow. You can look at the relative permeability. You can look at the uh, mixing on the two-phase flow, or you can look at the dissolution of the sample because of injection of acidic solution, for example. So I'm not gonna go today a lot uh, much around the governing equations, but just to give you a taste of it, uh, after you have a pore network of the rock, basically this pore network represents the open space, pore space of the rock. After you have that one, you start to write mass balance equation for these objects, which are called pore bodies, and connection with, with, between them that are pore throats of the uh, sample. And when you write mass balance equation, for example, here is for concentration, basically says that the change of concentration inside this pore throat is as a function of what concentration coming from this upstream pore body, what is leaving this one, and what is being consumed as sink and source due to adsorption reactions here. And then you write this equation. When you solve them, you get concentrations within sample. So for concentration, now I go for the uh, flow and solid transport. So basically, like here, 
you have a poor network model. Now you know this poor network model could be a direct mapping or extra image of sample, or could be one that you just generated by computer. And after that, for example, here, I let a tracer, a salt tracer to penetrate through the network. And you can see how does it percolate pore by pore. And then at different locations of it, here I put it at the beginning, middle, and end. I look at how this concentration arrives, like a time arrival, breakthrough curve of the concentration. And using these breakthrough curves, you can calculate the solute spreading or dispersivity between the rocks. So basically, this parameter tells you when the solute here is penetrating to the rock, how does it spread around? And that is one of the important parameters that you need to find uh, for your sample. And that's the way one way to do it. So you make a sample, you do a test using a, a, a poor network modeling, you get the breakthrough curves by analyzing it, you get dispersivity of the, uh, the sample. And so this is now a simple stage that you have uh, uh, that basically you have the uh, pore spaces all filled with one liquid and then you have a tracer transporting them. So, and once again, as I mentioned, you get your sample, you, you perform exit tomography, you have its pore spaces, you can use it directly for pore network modeling or analyzing of it, or you can from that make equivalent samples and then do modeling. And that dispersivity that I've shown to you or permeability that I've shown to you, then can be used in a Darcy scale model. For example, if you have a core, you can look at individual pores of it, but in general, inside the core, you know that the flow is one directional, but to do a 1D model of it, you need those parameters. So that comes the importance of pore scale modeling to provide you transport parameters that you need to put in the continuum scale model. And uh, this is another example that shows like a, a, a simulated flow with the uh, rock samples. And I said, as I mentioned, the value of these simulations are that, that they provide also then pore by pore information of the transport of flow or chemicals or clogging within the sample. So here you can see different samples. The references here, actually this is also from uh, Mario Limo from the uh, LARP group in Brazil. And, and then you can analyze the samples, uh, solve for fluid flow and pressure. And here you can see what you get is that from each pore of the sample, you know the velocities and, and you can see what is the variations of velocity along the sample. And you can see, for example, when the front of concentration or phase is going, how many of it, how much of it is being trapped behind the front. So with this, I, I gonna now move to the time that you have two phases within the sample. So for two phase flow, as I mentioned, there is, for example, uh, water or air or uh, or gas and uh, oil uh, within the sample. The main mechanism that comes here is that at the pore scale, the main mechanism is that when you can see also in this picture, in the in the absence of the non-wetting phase, like here, all the pore space is free to flow. When you have a, a non-wetting phase then the streamlines are changed because this air, for example, blocks the flow of the fluid. And to do that, we try to simulate transport inside these corners of the, uh, the non wetting phase. And that is what all together would, would create the relative permeability of the sample, like how much the presence of this phase is changing the permeability of your sample. And when you, you do that one, you can see, for example, you need uh, extra uh, terms in your uh, uh, equations. I'm not going to go through it, uh, to each of them, but in general, as I mentioned, like the whole pore space is filled with the wetting, but the non-wetting can transport itself along the corners of the rock pores. So here is simplified pore spaces, and you can see the non-wetting here stays in the center, and the wetting phase goes along the pores and would transport itself. And if you simulate this, for example, you have a rock initially with wetting phase and the non-wetting phase comes from this phase. When you increase pressure, more non-wetting phase comes in and then you can plot how much of pressure you have inserted and how much of the pore space is now occupied by non-wetting phase, which gives you the capillary pressure saturation curve, right? And furthermore, under each distribution of the non-wetting phase, you're gonna, you're gonna let the fluid flow through the sample. 
And that gives you the permeability of the sample, which on a two-phase flow we call the relative permeability, because you can see here that some of the pore spaces are filled by non-wetting phase shown by red, and some of them are filled by the wetting phase shown by blue here. But not all the space is open for the wetting phase, therefore the permeability, the relative permeability lowers with saturation decrease of your relative, uh, your uh, wetting phase. And and then on top of this, imagine you have this stage now, then one step of, one more step of complexity comes in, and that's now a chemical also is transported through sample. Obviously, you can see as water cannot flow through all the pores, the chemical also would only flow through certain pores of the sample. And that's why if you look at the transport under two-phase flow, your spreading of the chemicals depends also on saturation because the more drainage you have in your system, the more the non-wetting phase is occupying some of the pores and then therefore the wetting phase, which for example may, may contain surfactants or um, chemicals in it, uh, would go to more tortuous way. And that's why the spreading is a function of saturation. I'm again not going to detail of this because it's also spreading increases because tortuosity increases, but it lowers again because at some point these main pathways would be also blocked by this red phase. So, so there is no space for the fluid to go much faster, much slower, and you get more convergence of the velocity field. But the idea to show to here is that the spreading of the solute is also a function of the uh, is also a strong function of saturation. And you can see it when you do perform, when you perform poor network modeling, a poor scale model, you can see it clearly why does it happen. And you can uh, basically, uh, for example, with this, you can you can decide that uh, injecting of any chemical into porous materials can be done under specific saturation if you want to maximize the spreading of that chemical in subsurface. These are, for example, the um, typical uh, applications that you can uh, take from such models. And if further, now imagine that that fluid is flowing with the chemicals, but also those chemicals are like particle fines or um, macromolecules that they start to attach. Then what happens is that as the chemical grows, it, sorry, transports, it also attaches to the solid grains, to the non-wetting, wetting, wetting uh, interfaces. And then in these um, uh, models, you have an extra term that would take into account the adsorption, which is showed by S here, so solid mass, uh, sorry, adsorbed mass. And, but what happens is that when you have multi-phase multi flow, when the chemicals are transporting, then the chemicals have the opportunity to also attach at the interfaces, not only at the grain surfaces, but at the interfaces. And this is, a, that is also one thing that is added to the system on top of the, a single phase flow because in a single phase you only have the interface of grains and and a pore right but on the on the two phase flow you have interface of grain and the pore plus interface of non wetting and the pore and non wetting and the grain so there are more locations that adsorption can take place and another thing is that if you if you uh, see uh, this issue, then of course the amount of interfaces changes with saturation, right? Because it depends on how much of that phase you have. So the more in, the less saturation you have, the more non-wetting is there, and the more interface you have there. So there is more chance for chemicals to be get absorbed in the system. And with um, um, this one, then I will go one step uh, further, and now you can imagine that. What if the system, also the pores are dual porosity? But what I mean by dual porosity is that if you look at this image here, for example, you have a larger pores here, but you have also much, much smaller pores. And if you zoom in, you can have even a smaller pores. So that's why, for example, such system you can call dual porosity. Like one pore system is this one, big pores, but there are also smaller pores. It's, this is a carbonate rock, but also a soil that I perform research on them a lot. That's a common thing. In soil, you have aggregates. So you have a, inside aggregates, mostly composed of, for example, organic materials or clays. You have a small pores, but also between this aggregate, you have these bigger pores, much bigger pores. Therefore, you have uh, two different porosities. One, this porosity for very small pores and one with macro pores or bigger pores in between. And you can imagine the complexity that this, uh, 
uh, dual process system will insert on the uh, behavior because flow happens here mostly with advection, but here mostly with diffusion, and there is exchange of mass between these two. So for that, in the poor network modeling, we provide these two pore spaces differently. So what we do, for example, one method that we perform is that we make a macro or big pore space and we make the small pore spaces and then we stitch these together to become with the sample, which has the big pores and small pores. So you can see the size of the big pores are here and the size of the small pores are here. Like the small pores are much, much smaller than the big pores. And then we uh, uh, stitch them together to come with one single uh, network model. And what we do in the next stage, this is the network model. You can see these are big pores and these sphere shape are the uh, uh, smaller pores. And then we start to inject a concentration from here to see how fluid flows into different domains differently and how solute while it's passing would penetrate differently. Because if I go to the previous slide here, if a solid is passing, you can imagine it goes faster into these big pores, but still, it diffuses in the small pores and would be, as a conclusion, it would be also releasing out slowly. So now I will show this effect in a video here. So here is a, you can see, okay, it comes in a, in a sec. We have these three samples. You can see these are aggregate between these macro pores and now a solute comes from this side. You can see solute goes red here, but here you can see inside the aggregate because the pores are smaller, it goes more slowly. Towards lower, the sample pores are bigger. That's why here you can see it goes more or less uniformly, but here it has more resistance because these aggregates here are much smaller. And now if you stop injecting solute, you inject clean water, you can see the aggregates that solute went to them now keep the solute for much longer time, right? So that's, that impacts the whole transport of chemical and species inside the uh, rock pore space when you have multiple porosities. And this shows the breakthrough curve of concentration. So what comes out with different samples. And what you particularly see here, you have a long tailing here. And the reason for long tailing is that, as you can see here, lots of solute remained in the smaller pores, which comes out by diffusion. So it's much longer time. And to a bit link it to our other studies that before, I, I, I mentioned to you that we perform lots of the poor uh, microfluidic studies. We also make microfluidics, which have the grains and dual porosity grains. And we perform tests on them. And you can see it here, for example, how the solid would preferably go between the spaces and then go slowly bit into the uh, dual porosity. So we use this because this is, these are experiments. And the other one, the previous one was model, and we use them to validate our numerical models. And then this graph, I'm not going into details of it, but this basically shows the mass transfer between the two domains. So now we go to the next level of complexity in a, a subsurface process. And that is like now you can imagine up to now, you, there is a rock and flow and transport happens in the rocket. But the rock structure is not changing. But from now on, um, I will go to reactive transport and evolving pore spaces. So what if you have a sample, rock sample, that the fluid that is flowing through it reacts with it? And you have a rock fluid interaction, which is uh, happen um, uh, a lot in the subsurface, especially when we are looking now for uh, CO2 storage or uh, various kind of energy applications. You have the rock fluid interactions. So now the complexity is that the pore space, as it dissolves or precipitates, changes the size. And when that happens, your permeability and flow changes. So um, if you want to look at it arg um, algorithmically, um, you have a, a network that as flow goes through it, the pore network, as flow goes through it, as, and solute goes through it, you start to dissolve some of the pores or precipitate in other uh, some other pores. And, when you do that, the porosity changes, the size of pores are changing. So you should come back and simulate fluid flow in that sample again, because the pore size are changing, the flow field concentrations, capillary pressure, uh, entry capillary pressure, everything changes. So that's why you should make a loop to recalculate the properties of the sample. And an example of it, of course, as I mentioned that 
when we go through this process, the process become more complex. So what is now you need to add to the system is chemical reactions. So for example, in this one, I'm, I'm uh, we have simulated transport of um, uh, uh, acidic solution, uh, car calcium carbonate uh, is inside a, a rock, but we have CO2 equilibrated with water. So acidic solution of the, from equilibrium of CO2 with water is injected through the sample. When it, it goes into the sample, you can see the pH lowers because you're injecting the acidic solution into the sample. But when pH is lowered, right, you start to dissolve the rock. And as of when you dissolve it, the pores get larger. So you can see around the same uh, area or zone that pH is lowered, the pores get larger because they are being dissolved. And when you dissolve the pores, the pore size distribution of your sample is going to change. So this is the whole uh, process that all together causes change in transport properties because the transport properties of your rock are depending on the pore sizes and the, the way they are connected. And you can see the pore size distribution changes as a function of the solution because you're dissolving the pore spaces. So um, as example of it, I'm going to show you two examples. One is actually uh, about the wellbore cement. Uh, what the importance of the wellbore cement is that in a reservoirs or uh, or also for uh, injecting CO2 um, storage and other kind of subsurface storage, after you inject uh, the um, uh, material through the wellbore, you put the cement inside the wellbore to, to prevent leakage through the wellbore back to the surface. For example, if you inject CO2, you don't want the CO2 that is stored come back to the surface through the well that you injected it. That's why they put cement in that well. And what happened, this cement is then later, of course, in contact with CO2 because uh, first you have, before that you have injected CO2. So what we wanted to do in this research, we wanted to look at the cement that you use to, to plug the well, how does it react with CO2 that you have stored down in the reservoir? And for that, uh, you can see what, what is happening is that um, by time, CO2 is acidic and it's going to dissolve part of cement. This is Portland concentration, which is a reactive mineral in cement. It's going to be dissolved. So in that aspect, you would feel that the cement is being um, degraded and dissolved away, and the pores get lo larger, so there is more leakage. However, the story is much more complex than it. And the reason is that when you start to dissolve Portlandite, you are releasing calcium, which because of presence of it, you have precipitation of calcium carbonate into your rock. In your cement and as a result actually the cement um, uh, uh, permeability may even lower it's not uh, uh, goes high but even goes less because as experiments have shown you have um, this solution inside your cement because you're dissolving uh, uh, part of the portland of your cement but in parts of your sample like here that arrows are downward you have precipitation of calcium carbonate of your uh, inside your uh, calcium i'm sorry inside your sample. And this precipitation causes that part of your cement becomes much, much more impermeable. And as a result, because permeability is a harmonic property, a harmonic average, it means that you can have big pores, but if you have a zone of very small pores along your sample, the permeability is going to be much lower. And here you can see that such a zone is created because of precipitation of calcite and permeability goes uh, lower in it. And this is one thing we have done with poor network modeling, but the value of it is that such a process that was not uh, being easily modeled with continuous scale model, you can see all the behavior, all the details that, I, again, I, because of time, I'm, I'm not going through it. I just, in this session, I want to give you a taste of what can poor network model can do. Um, because for these all details, we have workshops of three, four days uh, to explain all the process behind this. But uh, here, you can see that basically in poor network modeling, uh, you can look at when the CO2 gets into the cement, how some of the pores are being uh, opened up, some of them being clogged, and what is the pH into the sample, and how does the transport of chemistry happens between the pores, and how chemical reactions are taking place to change that chemistry alongside. And all together, it would finally show all this process together. How did they change porosity of your sample and permeability of the sample? So... As I said, the interesting thing here was that you are dissolving a sample, but so the intuitive sense would tell you because you're dissolving the sample, the porosity goes higher and permeability also should go higher. 
because pores are larger. But actual permeability goes lower here because although you're dissolving it, you're precipitating a rim of very small a rim, but with much, much smaller pores here, which causes the permeability lowers as a, in for the whole sample. And now I move to another example of reactive transport uh, with a, a sandstone, like when you have a rock that is not all made up of calcium carbonate, but percentage of as cement. And you can see if you have a sample like this, initial sample, and the color shows the reactive mineral, if you continue for a few days, inject acidic solution into it, by time, you're dissolving the reactive minerals, right? That's, that's an intuitive thing, which also the model would show it as well. So the reactive minerals would be dissolved over time. However, the challenge is that if you have this sample, if you inject flow with high velocity, you're going you're gonna, to uh, dissolve it uniformly like this. Imagine if you inject the same acid, but with much, much lower velocity, the acid would have more time to dissolve at the close to the inlet of your sample rather than later. And that's why the change of the rock behavior when you have acidic solutions depends not only on the type of acid and type of rock, but also depends on the velocity uh, of the injection, which you can make it also in Peclet number because we like dimensionless numbers to characterize the process. And if I summarize this together, is like if you have a sample before the solution, now if you dissolve, dissolve this sample under with high flow rate, you get such a distribution of the uniform increase along the sample for permeability. If you do it on the low velocity, permeability close to the inlet of your sample increases, but further permeability did not increase. Now, what would be the behavior difference between these two? Here, naturally, you get higher permeability. And the reason is that in this sample, although permeability increased here, but here permeability did not increase. And this piece works as a bottleneck to lower the permeability of the sample, basically to not let the permeability increases. But here, permeability everywhere increases a tiny bit. So the permeability would, in average, also increases. And that is why uh, if you plot permeability of your sample versus the porosity that is due to the solution, that relation is not unique. It depends on velocity or Peclet number in this case. is dimensionless velocity Peclet number kind of. And you can see if you have a higher flow rates for a given reaction amount of the solution, you get more permeability of your sample. And you can explain it using this process here. Because again, if you're dissolving a rock on the low, process, low flow rate, you dissolve at the inlet, but further you're not dissolving and the permeability is a harmonic average. It depends on all the properties of the sample, not only here. And the bottleneck effect of this undissolved part could keep the permeability low still. And of course, as I mentioned, your initial sample has a pore size distribution. And when you dissolve a sample, the pore sizes will also change over time. And the one of the, I'm going now, Approaching the end of the uh, presentation, another um, uh, reactive transport that I would like to show you is a rather recent work that we, we did in combination with X-ray tomography. So we did X-ray imaging while dissolving a, a carbonate rock. And the same, so the process is this, right? That you have a rock, you're injecting acidic solution, the pH goes low. As a result of reaction, pH goes low, you get this solution, pores get long, larger. And as you can see it here, this shows the rock and this uh, pink, color shows the part that have been dissolved, right? So in this one we did, um, it's kind of kind of also shows a summary of what I've shown to you because in this study, we looked at the single pore at the really at the surface to see how this solution happened at the surface of the minerals because that determines the dissolution rate. And so this is a very, very like nanoscale. And later you go to one pore. You can see if you have a pore like this, when the solution happens, it gets widened. It opens up because of the solution, right? This is a, a pore. This is like much larger. So this part is a small piece of this pore. And then you have one pore. And then we did experiment and numerical analysis on the single pore to see how that, that pore, how this pore from initially would change, would open up because of the solution. And then from the information of this rock, we plugged 
it in into the poor network modeling to see how the dissolution changes fluid flow of the sample. And inside that, uh, also because we, we did exotomography, we have uh, the pore structure of the rock as shown here to see how the pores are growing uh, when the when uh, uh, reactions have taken place. So this is um, also uh, again shows the multi-scale character of the uh, subsurface applications that you have a nanoscale hap process happening at the surface of reactive minerals. And then you have, if you zoom out, you see single pores. If you zoom out, you see 3D samples. And from this, if you get properties, uh, they hopefully are all these transfer properties that I've shown to you that you can go back and plug them inside the uh, field scale model. So to be able to do reservoir simulations on a more accurate manner. And that's the idea of the whole study that I have uh, uh, shown to you. And with that, I just have uh, some uh, yeah, references I've uh, used here. And I would like to thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please, I'm happy to uh, raise it. I will be happy to respond. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amir. Thank you for our fantastic presentation. We have time for uh, some questions as we, as we are advanced in our uh, schedule. Let me turn on the light here. So, <laughs> Paulo Alex, you would like to be the first? <laughs> uh, yeah, if you are talking here. I, I suggest you come a little bit closer to the microphone. Thank you. Ah, okay. In the in the in you the have to introduce yourself first. I, I don't know if uh, Professor Mihope already knows you. I think I, I, I think so because he was uh, the, the committee of ah, Harvard right. Defense. Right, yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, it's related to, to the last part of the of the presentation, the, the very interesting one. But uh, uh, in the in the repeat the solution that you have uh, uh, shown in the last, uh, uh, exactly related to, to Barbara Woods, is, is there any uh, modification of the network topology due to this solution? Uh, I was wondering if there is any mechanism that you have uh, implemented in the code. Yeah, so thanks for the question. Uh, and of course, I remember you from the uh, meetings we had also with the defense session. And um, so, yes, as I've shown, the size of the pores in reactive transport, the size of individual pores are changing. So at different time steps, we look at how, how much of the uh, reactions taking place. So you calculate reaction rate from the reaction rate, you know about the consumption of the reactive minerals. And you take that one and you have molar volume of it and you change the pore volume accordingly. So then uh, in consecutive times, uh, uh, times, you basically let the pores get larger or smaller. And that's what I shown in my presentation that when pH goes lower, you can see the pores are growing, right? We have also more uh, a mechanism that we are implementing now uh, to, to let merging of different pores and all these uh, things as well. Uh, but it's not included in that uh, presentation. But uh, uh, that's a bit of thing that I'm trying to understand what would be the added value of it, because anyways, the pores are getting larger, so you can merge them or just keep them still apart. That's a bit of numerical thing, because it, it, things get, of course, you, you just need to find in, in which level of complexity you want to take to be more representative of sample. But yes, pores are getting um, larger pore bodies, pore throats, and uh, we consider this over time. Okay. Okay. So uh, in this in these uh, simulations, uh, no pore merging yet. So in this simulation, I've shown to you, pores get larger. Yeah. Larger, larger, but they are not becoming one. Okay. However, okay. that's also yeah in in the in the model because the 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 uh, uh, floor for study are quite dynamic models. It's also possible to let them merge. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Amir. Do we have any questions online? No. No? Yeah. Anybody wants to make some any questions to Professor Anito? I have a question. 
Yes, please. So, sir. Pergunta daquele modelo, não. Você não entendeu. Então, please introduce yourself first. Hi, Amir. I'm a PhD student in chemical engineering program here in COP. And uh, my question is about the. I, see, I don't remember if it's one phase or two phase, but there is a, in trans solid transport, there is a non-equilibrium model. Uh -huh. I, I, my question is, there is in a more complex model than a direction dispersion equation for what is the model? So, um, so look, we have, uh, we have a transport processes and we had the mechanisms that are involved in, in, to, to perform the transport mechanism. So uh, the, two, the two transport mechanisms that you simulate are advection, diffusion, and reaction. So these three will be taken into account. Huh? Advection, diffusion, they, they, they are responsible to take the mass along. There's no other, at least not in the normal process, this, these are the only two. And you have the reactions taking place, right? So, and when the uh, sample is, for example, on a two phase, uh -huh, we perform those fluxes only at the corners of the wetting phases, uh -huh, and and different in a wetting phase and separate in non-wetting phase, right? So, what I want to tell you is that the the type of process are still advection diffusion. Just the implementation of them is more. Um, uh, challenging, difficult, which are Im implemented in the models that I've shown to you, because then uh, the solute, for example, once the solute that goes into the wetting phase is different from the solute that goes in the non-wetting phase, the concentration, because they don't mix naturally easily together. So you have to have these two differently calculated, and then in the interface, you define the mass transfer between the two, and that's what you saw as a mass transfer functions, right? Uh, because, for example, you can imagine that uh, if Imagine you have a gas and you have oil. Well, some components are better dissolved in gas and some more uh, transporting gas and some in oil, right? And, and that's why, for example, you have a the oil transport and evaporation to the gas. So there are two different mechanisms. On, and that's why, you, that's why you saw the equations becoming more involved is because then each fluid phase would has its own transport in it. But then you have a, a, another set of terms, which call mostly our mass exchange, mass transfer, that tells how much from one phase goes to the next one. And then uh, and the complexity comes that this interface is also changing over time because you have a rock. And if you have a gas in it and change, saturation is changing, it means the amount of interfaces is changing. It means that the connection between the uh, gas phase and liquid phase, the amount of area of connection is changing. So these things are dynamic. But that's why they are calculated dynamically into the port network. Okay, but uh, my question is also the macro macroscopic model. When you fit the, mm -hmm. the through curves, if you use other model than the advection dispersion. Uh -huh. At the macroscopic scale. Yes. 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 So. Uh, I see. Good question. So at the macroscopic scale, you want to choose a model which can represent the behavior of your sample, right? So if you have, a, have lots of, like in, in two-phase flow, sometimes you cannot use advection dispersion equation. You have to use a non-equilibrium model at the macroscopic. And the reason is that, like the one I've shown to you in dual porosity, you have a tail, you have lots of non-equilibrium because of this presence of second phase there. So a simple advection dispersion model at macroscopic is not enough. It can simply not simulate the breakthrough curve, the chemical transport in your sample. And that's why you choose a more comprehensive, like the uh, uh, field scale with non-equilibrium term, or mobile immobile that Rin uh, van has developed to simulate the transport. But you take a you take macroscopic uh, formula, which is good enough, complex enough to be able to simulate the process. Yeah. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Amit. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Paula. Any, any other questions? So, Amit, thank you again for 
uh, opening the seminar week. Uh, wish My you, pleasure. Uh, all the best. Hope to see you soon. And uh, we will be back here in this channel in about uh, 25 minutes for the next presentation of uh, Dr. Rodrigo Surmas from Centis about uh, digital rock physics. Okay. Thank you very much, Abhi. You're welcome. Have a good later. day bye -bye. and enjoy the rest of the seminar. Bye-bye. Thank you very bye -bye. much. Bye-bye. Okay.